Thanks for that great introduction. Um, I'm actually quite relieved that not everybody's turned up. I was fairly horrified at the idea of a workshop with 250 people, so this is much better. We are constrained by the, um, the shape of this room because I'm definitely not going to be talking for the next two hours. So somehow or other we're going to have to manage to overcome these constraints and please um, feel free to ask questions and to offer suggestions. Um, I'm going to be making lots of suggestions, but I'm not a walking example of best practice. So there are people here who have got better ideas and who are doing things and who have come across things. It's a kind of area that's impossible to keep on top of completely. Um, I'm really welcoming that uh, contribution. It's quite tricky to prepare a, a, a workshop presentation like this, which is quite generic, because I have no idea how much people here are doing or know. I've had a look at the list I was sent and did some searches for people, one or two of which I'm going to show you. Um, so, so <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. So forgive me if I say the obvious or if I don't explain something well enough and please just say so in, in each case. Anybody remember this cartoon? So nowadays, I think the point that I, I need to make very emphatically is that we are a dog. We are a something whether we like it or not. And the, the one message from, from the session today is you need to take control of what kind of dog you are. It's at the moment fairly uh, random and quite often out of your control and I don't think that we all really keep on, on top of what we look like online but we, we really have to and as academics we have to take um, the advantage of the opportunities. I love these images. These are these are these wonderful reports that you get on the rise of data, which of course underpins information, which underpins knowledge um, in the world and how much there is. <clears throat> this is from last year and we're now into zettabytes. I mean, who's ever heard of zettabytes? This is in 2011, we've probably got double zettabytes by now. You know, it's this extraordinary notion of online data content and the, the the extraordinary thing about it is that we are largely providing that content. I think that's what we, we tend to forget. We, we used to a kind of concept of, concept of content where somebody designs it and someone makes it, the publishers. But actually in the, in the world that we live in now, we're the ones who make the content. It's our activities and our conversations and our behavior that is actually creating a lot of this content. So, um, the, the thing that I like about uh, this particular thing is the notion that there's nearly as many bits of information in the digital universe as stars in the physical universe. It's a wonderful metaphor. Um, and uh, the, the report that I took this from is actually focused very largely on security issues and privacy issues, which I'm only going to touch on today, but it's obviously something that's very relevant to, to all of us. What I am going to be uh, talking about is our digital footprints and our digital shadows. And about how to take control of these. So that, crudely speaking, the digital footprint is the, the content that we create and that we take control of and the digital shadow is the content created about us. Now there's absolutely no way of not having a digital shadow. The only way you can do that is to become a Luddite. If you are online, in the, in, on, the, in the, on the web, you're creating a digital shadow. If you buy anything from Amazon, you're creating a shadow. If you do any online banking, and of course if you use Google, you know, the whole issue around Google and the collection of information is a massive issue. 
and one must be aware at least of what one is doing. Google could tomorrow, I don't know, does anyone here remember Buzz, Google Buzz? Yeah, anyone? You remember, you, did you wake up one morning and you were suddenly exposed to the world? So what Google Buzz did was they decided that it would be really helpful if all of your content and connections were made openly available in the name of openness. And so you woke up one day if you were part of that pilot group and all your, um, all the things that you had in Google Reader, those of you who were using Google Reader, so all your porn sites or football sites or whatever that you had quietly put out there were connected to your name and all the people that you talk to a lot on email, you know, those people that you, your spouse didn't know about, they were all exposed and it was a complete disaster, but it was in the name of privacy and within 24 hours it was closed down. The shocking part of it is that Google actually has all of that information and it's up to us to actually engage with what that means. So a lot of these issues around privacy and so on are, are critical and we have to be mindful that that's happening and at the same time use it to our own ends. So I'm starting this conversation on the premise that it's there, it's the world we live in, let's make it work for us as much as we can, that's all I'm saying. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Pew studies. They did some, um, some research looking at the extent to which people search online, people search on Google for information about people. And it's, I mean, this is kind of common sense nowadays. It's just confirming what we know. And certainly my, I know in my own job as a recruiter, I've had people come into interviews and I've said to them, something rather I'm really interested to see your ex or fascinating to see you used to live in Y and people have gone. How do you know that? And actually it's very, very easy to, to find people. Someone we interviewed recently at Google had marked on a Google map his mother's house in Bulawayo. And we had a very interesting conversation about that, except that he hadn't realized that that meant we could find it quite easily. Okay, so this is the part where we do the, the interaction, or rather we take a couple of minutes before I move into talking some more. If you can take a piece of paper or your iPad or whatever you have in front of you and just take a couple of minutes to think before we talk about it, what would you like your digital footprint to look like and what kind of online presence you want in your position. Okay. People have paper and pen. Unfortunately, very nice. <laughs> One thing it can reliably work. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, you need another minute or two? No, yes. It's not one of those things where I ask you and then I come and tell you the answer, hey? It just isn't, I can't answer this for you. So, another minute. Seriously, the question is, what do you want? What's important to you? There's so many possibilities. Somebody just said to me, I've never given this a moment's thought before and that's scary because it's out there and somebody's probably making money from your presence too. Okay, who wants to overcome this difficult environment and 
make us feel more informal and speak about what you want. Somebody there, yay, someone with a red top. Um, I said I want mine to be professional, but you just have to show that um, I'm ICT savvy in the know, um, and it should be updated and clean and directed, so that there's no clutter or uncertainty or where I'm going. Thank you, those are very important points, and I think the first thing you've raised is a critical one about the professional and the personal. I think people need to think long and hard about their presence, especially people who have students, but in general, about the personal and the professional. So when I was doing some searches um, before the conference, before this event, somebody here who might or might not have turned up was mugged last week, wrote a long piece online about how they felt about it. And I think it, the tone of it was on a public Facebook site I'm not sure that they realized that I was going to be able to see that. Do you want that kind of information to be out there? So, something to think about, the professional, personal divide. Some people are very comfortable, that's who I am, you get the whole bang shoot. But something or not, and I think it's just something to consider. The other thing I think you said that was very important was the notion of focused. So if you want to be known as this person who's the IT person, that's the persona you want, that's, that's good, that's fine. Other thoughts? Laura? Uh, just going back to that point, do you think in terms of that divide between the personal and professional, as we go increasingly more digital, that's going to become less and less? <laughs> I think that it goes back to what, how much you monitor it and how much control you're prepared to take. I mean, if you follow this thing with Facebook settings, it's almost like a battle going on between users and Facebook. Yeah. Because Facebook needs us to be as open as possible because that, especially now that they've gone you know, the IPO route, they need advertisers. And our notion of what, my own personal notion around Facebook is a very small, closed, private space, but it's taking more and more effort on my part to keep it that way, because Facebook keeps insisting on opening things up, but they tell me, but quite quickly, and if I don't take notice because I'm too busy, the next thing it's exposed. Um, so I think one can, but it will require more vigilance on our part. Anyone else want to say anything about, yes? Is that Alice over yeah. who I'm just making, yes? Isn't it also, I mean, there are people who, who follow me for different reasons. I have family all over the place. And, and they don't really care about what I'm doing at work. Um, you know, it's more about showing me the latest baby of the grand cousin, 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 cousin. <laughs> or, or, you know, or, or who's had a family reunion, this one, or catching me up on that. And I wouldn't put that on my, uh, nobody here would care about that. And I don't, they don't care about the other part. So, I mean, you have to have like separate pages. Mm -hmm. So, for, to keep those things separate. So you're talking about multiple profiles. Yeah, multiple person, multiple profile disorder. Yeah. yeah. Not split personalities, just multiple yeah. profiles, <laughs> different dimensions. Some people even have different Twitter um, yeah. uh, handles. I, I don't know, I mean, I've got four email accounts. Just because I don't want my personal one flooded with work. Okay, anybody else want to say anything? Yes. I think uh, there's a good answer to this because you get different social media networks. You get so Facebook. the light is on over there and somebody's talking. No, it's over here. <laughs> you will lie, okay. Okay, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm really feeling weird. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Well, like I said, you get different social media networks today. You get Facebook on the one end, which is designed for socialing and, like uh, Alice explained, you know, uh, family stuff. And then you get LinkedIn on the other side. It's more professional, you know, more for, more for our people. Like I'm a graphics consultant or whatever, and you put it on there. 
and the guy reading it in America sees your profile and he's like, okay, well, you know, I'm a graphics consultant too. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's something everybody should look for rather than get multiple personality disorder online. <laughs> so yeah. So you you're suggesting different tools for different um, persona, really? Yeah, and um, there are tools to use for this. There's not, you know, the internet is a vast thing. You can't just say, okay, well, I have a Facebook account and that's it. Everybody has a Facebook account, everybody has a Twitter account, everybody has an email account. Might as well get a LinkedIn account. Why not? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to just briefly talk about how we might think about this as networked scholars. And I'm not going to spend too much time on, on sort of the thinking about it part because it's a, a practical workshop, but I think some people might find these, uh, this honeycomb, I think some people have come across it before, the honeycomb of the networked uh, scholar and the different dimensions which one, one can, sort, can con consider around one's online identity as an academic. So presence, connections, reputation, and for those of you, us who say, I haven't really been thinking about it, in some ways, part of your reputation is being made online. So it's actually reputation management to use the speak. But some, make some, some of us feel uncomfortable, but that's what it is. The groups we're part of, the conversations we have, and who and what we're sharing with. Another way of thinking about it, which I, I quite like, um, is this notion of, of the different aspects of the scholarly primitives, which is that strange word, but what, a, what it actually means is the different functions that are common to the scholarly enterprise. And what researchers have found is that a, across all disciplines and across time, these are the, the core functions of the, the academic enterprise discovering, annotating, comparing, referring, sampling, illustrating, and representing, no matter whether you're in the sciences or commerce or whatever. And so uh, quite a useful way of thinking about it is what kinds of social media tools are associated with each of those um, activities, those core activities. And that's, that's quite a nice way of of going through it if you want to be systematic about um, your, your online activities. I, I, I had thought of, of using this as the frame for the workshop and I haven't gone that way. I might do that at some point, but it's quite nice as a, as a way of actually anchoring us in our academic space and, and one that we all share. This word sharing is absolutely critical in the academic space. I mean, it's critical online, and it's worth just stopping for a moment because look, scholarship and academic work has always been about sharing. It's, it's the, the basis of, of what scholarship is about. The scholar, you know, the scholar to scholar, scholar to community, scholar to student, those kind of key relationships. But what happens in the online space is it really changes the nature of sharing quite fundamentally. So in the online space, sharing means multiplying, not dividing. So in the physical space, you have a book. Either you give it to the book, the person, and then you don't have the book. So it's, it's either or, or you have an apple and you break it in half. In the online space, sharing means multiplying, and it means multiplying in an, an I can't say it that word now, infinitum. So you can share with as many people as have connectivity, to go back to somebody's earlier point. Um, it also used to mean exchange, so you give me yours, I'll give you mine, and we've swapped. Now everybody can give to everybody. So there's the many, many to relations. So it really changes what, what, what's happening. Um, and, and that really is quite critical if we think of what we want as academics in the online space. And, and my argument would be 
focus on how and what you want to share. And sharing is an effort. I mean, it's a technical non-effort because it's been made so much easier. Files just get copied. But, uh, you know, as we'll, as we'll discuss, making sure that your work is shareable and findable is a, is a, is a bit of an effort. Oh, and just a last point that's quite nice is that Latour um, differentiates between different types of intermediaries. So there are those who transport messages without transforming them, and those are just the intermediaries, and then are those who, who change elements, and those are mediators. And if you think of Twitter, if you're a, um, a retweeter, then you're a straight intermediary. If you comment on something, you're a mediator. So what a dreadful blog posting came up this morning is a different kind of tweet to just retweeting the blog posting without comment. Okay, so these are really kind of the core thoughts around the, the practicalities of, of the process. So we've done the kind of reflective uh, abstract stuff and now we're getting on to a suggested process. Um, and in my work at uh, the University of Cape Town, as part of the Open UCT initiative, we're actually working on a guide um, with our fantastic intern, Sarah Goodyear, who drew this, this picture for me over the weekend when I told her what I was doing. And we will certainly make that guide available under a Creative Commons license, of course. Um, and it's really a process for academics to go through, and we've actually been going through this process with academics at our university. So looking at your profile as an individual, assessing and then making decisions, looking at your outputs, assessing and making decisions, and then looking at your communication and connections and assessing and making decisions. That's what we're going to be doing now. Okay. Any questions? No? All right. Okay, so let's start with assessing. You know, people talk about vanity searches. They're actually not vanity searches. They are critical. And you know that you can do a, a Google alert of your name. You can do one in Google and you can do one in, in Google Scholar. And you really need, if you're an academic and you're taking your reputation management seriously, you need to know who's quoting you and what they're saying about you. So put a Google alert on your name. That's why I have another Google account, by the way, for all those funny things like that. Because I don't want that coming into my personal account. Okay, so there we go. <laughs> so now I just need to say a couple of things about Google searches before I, before we go into this. Um, I've just been working on a paper and reading a lot about Google, so I have been fairly blown away by the complexity of the issues and quite concerned, in fact, about some of the issues. So you might say, wow, Paul's doing something right. And he is. Except that I did this search yesterday at UNISA. And if I had done the search as a Canadian, okay, George, you're not a good example because you're in the field. If I had done this as a Canadian funder who's not in the field, I probably wouldn't have got the same result. So we need to be very mindful about Google. Geolocation means that Google sets your search to local findings, which has consequences, it has serious consequences. So it means that what somebody somewhere else is going to find is not going to be identical. It's going to overlap, but it won't be identical. The other issue which is very important is what Google's done with personalization. So Google personalizes your searches in two ways. One, it personalizes on the basis of searches you've already done. So obviously I'm likely to have looked for people like Paul. It's my field. 
If there was a Paul Prince Lu out there who was incredibly important for world peace, but based in Korea, he probably won't turn up because that's not what I've been looking for lately. That's actually a bit of a problem. But there's another dimension that I hadn't fully understood, which is that Google also personalizes by matching you with other people like you. So it doesn't, the algorithm doesn't only take into account um, your own searches. It says, this is the sort of person who looks for this sort of thing. We're going to match you with other people and give you their types of findings. So it actually keeps like with like, which is something we really need to know about. And there, there's some philosophers who are arguing that this is actually a danger to the public good because it actually keeps people from engaging with a lot of issues. But I won't go into the philosophical side of it right now. I'm just saying that you must be mindful, even when you're doing these regular Google searches, that other people out there won't necessarily find um, exactly what you find. Um, I'm going to come back to that. So here's an interesting example. I don't know if this person is here. Masengu Ilunga? He's on the Florida campus. Okay, so if he's listening or if he's here, I hope you don't mind that I used you as an example. What's interesting about him is that he, he's either a footballer or an ex-footballer or his father's a footballer. But you will see that the first um, hit for this man is about football. And I read that Wikipedia entry and it's all about football. And he was a footballer in the 1980s, so in fact he could be an ex-footballer. But you, that's something you need to manage. So that's the one thing I want to say. The other thing I want to say is that in the work that I've been doing around uh, findability and so on, Google, Google, I can't speak for the other search engines, but Google does have 80% of the market. Google, general Google searches provide Wikipedia as the number one hit consistently. And I think that has profound implications for academics. The obvious thing being, we need to put our stuff into Wikipedia. Furthermore, the research is showing that, acad that academics use Wikipedia. So the information scientists and the library research that's going on, you know, um, Academics have this kind of love-hate relationship with Wikipedia and they don't let their students use it and it's very uneven. But given its power and given that it's the sixth most popular website in the world, I actually would argue that as academics we need to actually stake our claim in Wikipedia. And there's a whole movement, for example, in the doctors in the medical fraternity where there are doctors who actually work together to put accurate information into Wikipedia. So Wikipedia just comes up consistently and I think, I hope that we're going to have time and Wi-Fi for people to do a quick Google search now and I will be very interested to know whether you all find in this room that Wikipedia does come up as number one. Um, okay, what else can I observe here? Um, LinkedIn seems to come up once again, let's have a look and see what comes up in this room. LinkedIn seems to come up very highly immediately when you're looking for a person. So if getting your accurate, focused reputation um, is important to you, then keep your LinkedIn profile up to date. In the work we've been doing with academics at our university, we've discovered some of them have five LinkedIn profiles because they forgot and they had a previous one and they couldn't remember the passwords, so they made another one, etc. And I don't think that's uncommon. The other interesting thing about um, the search is that in that opening uh, group of hits is um, Prof Ilunga's PhD dissertation in full PDF open. Now that's fantastic and that's a credit to Witz's open access repository because one of the things most academics want is people to find and read their work. So this is really great and this tells you something about the value of um, 
bothering to put your work into the repositories, which I'm going to harp on about later. Um, here's another one of our, our colleagues who is here. Alan, would you like to comment on, um, since, um, since you are here, what do you see? Can you hear him? The, the links in his right at the top, and then the contents that I attended to hear his names. So, um, then where I was at UJ, um, and then the YouTube. So, it is kind of picking up the, the most recent kinds of things that I've been involved in. I think it's interesting that YouTube is starting to play so highly. And I think that one of the things that we have to get our minds around, and certainly I don't know if this is an age-related thing or I hesitate to say that, but for many people, YouTube is a search engine. And this is a very big shift in the way that we think about things now. Um, that's the use of computer games. Does that lead to, I wasn't able to check, with, does that lead to the actual document? To the actual document, okay. Because I think increasingly the expectation is that people will want to go to the document, and so we'll talk about how that can be enabled. I did look at your CV, and I think you do have an accurate CV, and it comes up in the opening a few um, hits, and obviously if, if that is going to happen, it needs to be up to date, which yours is. So this is a nice example of best practice. Okay, if you have access to wireless, 3G, whatever, whatever, would you like to spend a minute or two, hopefully, just doing a quick search on yourself and see what you find? they'll suddenly open up a thing where your photographs that your friend tagged, and these are private, can suddenly come up in someone else's search. And actually, no. You know, I put up like I like to make things, like in a completely different part of myself. I create and do mosaics and everything. That's actually none of my professional life. And I share those, look at the pot I've just made, with maybe 20 friends in different parts of the world. You know, it's not like they are secret, they just are different. Yeah, you see, yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. I mean, like, I, I don't like it either. I, mean, mm. I, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even, I would hardly ever comment on something like that. Yeah. Like, like some, some people connect their tweets into their Facebook profiles yeah. and then no. flood their profiles. Yeah. And sort of no. I don't like it. Mm -mm. You know, it's, it's just private stuff, you know. Yeah. I, I'm hardly ever there, and if I'm there, I don't want it to be public. Yeah, like, but they really don't help us. <laughs> Okay, what have you found? There's somebody who's got your name who does something extraordinary? No, not so far. <laughs> oh, it's him. <laughs> yeah. Greg and Greg Kroll. Greg nice Kroll and person. you too. And where are you from? I'm from, I'm from Sadie. From Sadie. Yes, 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 I know your name. Yes, I'm following you on Twitter. So I see um, am I following you on Twitter? Yes, that's why I know your name. Yeah. That's great. Do you look like your picture? Yes. That's also why. Yeah, I don't like people who put um, images and then you don't know who they it's are. You don't, yes. That's not what I want people to be thinking about. <laughs> okay, so what but have you found you out about that? yourself? But how do you change that? Her master's, yeah. just Sarah. The first thing that comes up is my master's degree. I really don't want people to be reading my master's degree. It's crap. <laughs> okay. But you can quite clearly tell that I'm vegan. That's, That's very yeah. interesting. Okay. <laughs> Now, now you've got a question is how do you get rid of Not that so fact? I've got my, my name that everyone calls me and then I've got my given names. Ah. And, and a lot of the content, I mean, like conference tenants, so they might get like my, my 
given names and put the whole set in there. But that does not come up if you just search. That's a, you know that's that we have that problem in our institution yeah. as well. When they changed the email, they used the name on people's forms. People yeah. went ballistic. They were so angry. But one of the professors, what he does is he started publishing under his name what they called it. So immediately. How do you do that? So well, then they don't use your given name. Then they use your name that you called from. Because he's GT is and actually he's never six. So he started publishing under six, mm. and that way it started conforming. Otherwise, you will have to change. <laughs> you will have to change what people call you. And, oh, you don't have access? No, no, no. Oh, no, that's so bad. What can we do? Uh, sorry, um, excuse me. Would you mind letting these gentlemen um, have a quick look for themselves? Go and do a search so you can at least see what comes up. It won't take long. It will take long. But it's scary. It's very scary. Okay, there you go. You don't have access. I'm Lawrence doing the rounds. Interesting. Okay. Someone said there that the first thing that came up was her masters, and she doesn't want people to read her masters because it's crap. That's the first thing that came. But how can you? No, I didn't point to you as anonymous. But now that you've identified yourself, Sarah. And the dilemmas, how do you change that? Okay, what, you have, have, what have you found about, about yourself? I can, I can go back. I didn't, I couldn't get through. You couldn't get through, but you see it on here. Yes. Okay, how's everyone doing? Do you need a minute or two? Yeah? Okay, take it. Would you want to take another minute and think about what you've observed, what you've reflected, what you might want to share with the rest of us? Did you get a fright? Is it what you wish? Okay, right, some comments. All right. Yes. It's always a situation. It's always? The Citroën seller who posts up first when I Google my name. The what? The car salesman. The car salesman. <laughs> okay, so this gentleman over here made a very useful point. He says he makes sure that whenever he writes something, he uses his name distinctively. So I think one of the ways of taking control is to do something that differentiates yourself, whether it's, you know, Frank L. Smith or Frankie Smith or something. If you know that that's going to happen, what can you do to distinguish yourself? What did you? What, what is your name that you've made it uh, dis distinct? Um, I did exactly that. Um, I say Terence R. Carney. So um, every time it just says Terence Carney, for instance, and I tell me. Right. Okay. And that means that you effectively training everyone else out there. So no, there's also, um, I try to have a professional um, name or title or whatever. And so everything that I, like I said, for instance, my Google search is only uh, delivered all my articles that I've written. And it's under that specific name. So and every time I do anything privately, I, do, I normally do not, I normally drop the R, the other initial. Um, and then I also, for instance, my Facebook um, name is completely different. Okay. Yeah. So then I also know if there's a Terence Garney, for instance, in Facebook or LinkedIn, whatever, it's not me. Okay. And somebody at the back was talking about this question of names. I don't know if you want to comment. Um, you know, many South Africans have various given names. So if you have your three initials, but everyone just knows you by your new norm, um, it's difficult every time to have to explain to people, no, my initial is not A, it's C. Okay, um, yes, you were going to say something? Yeah. Uh, I found that the first thing or we'll site that comes up when I search my name is a blog that I have, which is on Google. So I thought because it's associated with Google, that's why it comes up. That's right. That's a very, that, that goes back to this, this kind of Google ecology, is one way of talking about it. Google Empire is another way of talking about it. Um, so, for example, we're going to talk later about uh, tracking and new measures of impact. 
I don't know if you, on Twitter, if you use a, a shortener, you know, for a URL, if you want the, if you want any URL that you mention to be associated with you, you should use the Google shortener. So, you know, the Google shortener is G-O-O dot G-L. And Google will pick up that it was you making that uh, link. So, which is part of the saying Google Ecology. And I wonder if your blog would come up first if it wasn't in Google. That's a very useful point. Um, some of the, this question, and a couple of people mentioned it. Okay, so are you going to talk to us about how to put things up? And the answer is yes, that's actually quite straightforward. What's much more difficult is how to take things down. And as uh, someone else said to me, the internet never forgets. You know, I mean, if you really want to look for something, you can just use the Wayback Machine, which you know, has, you know the Wayback Machine? All previous websites, so you can search on the Wayback Machine. So even if you have a company and your company's got a new website, you can find the old website on the Wayback Machine. So it's very difficult to not have something and how you're going to remove that uh, masters that you don't like is actually a, quite a challenge and will require some kind of active intervention from you. But there are things that you can do to get the things that you want online. Um, any other comments? Yeah? Uh, just a quick question or a quick comment, I guess, is uh, one of the ways uh, you can't really get rid of stuff online, but I think a very effective strategy is something along the lines of obfuscation. So uh, the way, if you have something that you don't like, the best way to deal with it is to put other things up that you do like and gain profile of that. So it'll just progressively push those things down. If anyone's interested, I just tweeted a short link to a paper in First Monday that looked at uh, you know the vernacular around preserving uh, data that you don't want to necessarily have available. So it's literally an active obfuscation strategy where you're trying to make sure that data miners don't get the full profile of you through intervention approaches. Thank you. So make sure that all the stuff you're proud of and you want heard is there. Any last comments? Yes, you had a comment. Um, there's another way. There's another way around it to answer Mr. Paul Mr. Paul Prince's question about can you manage what shows up first? It's called search engine optimization, and um, it works really well with Google. And there's guys doing this for a living. So if, if you have a lot of money, because it costs a lot of money, but if you have it and you want to get something to rank first when they're typing a certain keyword or your name, whatever, you can actually do it. Yeah, now there's a very interesting discussion around search engine optimization and what Google considers acceptable and what Google considers evil. You know the wonderful Google notion of do no evil and where the line, where that fine line lies so I absolutely agree with you, and that's something that when we talk about discoverability, I will mention. But um, of course, Google changes that all the time. They, they, they change the rules of the game so that the whole thing isn't completely um, set up in that way. Okay, um, you can also do these uh, social media analytics. I must say I'm quite skeptical of them myself. I'm just mentioning them because people like to know about them. Um, so, uh, peer index measures your activity on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and something called Quora, which I've never heard of myself, so they can't be measuring anything of mine on there. Um, it shows you that my topics, my topic f uh, footprint are technology and internet and politics. Um, okay, so now we know that if you're talking about focus, if you do a check on this, you can see whether that is, you're on focus or not. Um, I, I do personally treat this with a little bit of skepticism because it's showing your social networks, but that doesn't necessarily tell you about your, I don't know, look, it's up to you, but it's there. You also get clout on Twitter, um, and they're a way of assessing your, your presence. You, it's, I think it's up for you to decide. I also discovered that if you go to Wolfram Alpha, um, which you know is this extraordinary search engine. It's more than a search engine, it's a computational search engine. 
um, and you, you click on a Facebook report, you can get an analysis of your Facebook activities. So those of you who um, do use Facebook for professional purposes, which as I said, I don't. So I didn't actually put mine on there because well, A, it's personal, but B, it didn't really have anything interesting. This is actually um, Wolfram, who is the guy behind this engine. But this is his analysis that I've put up there as an example. But you can do that as well, and that's quite a nice way of assessing what you're doing, you know, giving yourself some feedback. Laura? Yeah. Sorry, there's just a tweet from um, Derek Moore in Joburg says, anyone in academia taking clout seriously as they take stock of their own online presence? So he's, that's a question. Was that a comment? No, that's a question. I mean, I can only answer for myself. I don't. <laughs> but I don't know whether anyone does. Anybody else here want to comment? Any, anyone have views on clout and its usefulness? I, I would personally say cloud has actually, uh, it uh, has a pretty bad reputation. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, I, I don't think anyone should take it terribly seriously. Uh, they're not clear about the metrics. I think if you look at some sites, uh, you know, like academia and others that are more transparent in how they weight the metrics so that you understand what is comprised of a particular score. But yeah, cloud, I, I don't know very many people anywhere, never mind academia, that take it seriously. Okay. So you have, you have two of us who don't take it seriously at any rate. Okay, so I think just to summarize the section, consider your profiles, decide which one you want to focus attention on, clean them up. You know, if you've got five LinkedIn profiles, clean them up. Um, look at Google Scholar. I mean, we're talking about academia. You've got a possibility of a Google profile. Um, and if we're talking practicalities, choose a main academic profile and link to the others. So I would suggest somebody said, no, no, I don't want a LinkedIn profile. Given that LinkedIn comes up so often, I would recommend a LinkedIn profile with a link to your main profile. Your main profile might be on your university website or on your personal website. So I would suggest covering your bases, but putting the effort into one place. Until we have integrated systems, um, it's, just, it's just such a lot of effort at the moment. So make sure all your stuff and all your work is in one place and then link all the rest to it. Um, and one of the, yeah? I agree with you. I think it's very interesting. And if you do a search on <coughs> Google Scholar, you will get a citations number. And I think we need to understand exactly what that's coming from because it's more than just Scopus, which is a, a subscription metric, as you know. <coughs> the other thing I meant to mention earlier when we were talking about Google searches is they also take um, social media such as your Google Plus account into consideration when they do their searches. So they're linking them all. Uh, we were talking about academia.edu. This has got, I think, something like uh, almost 2 million academics worldwide on it. So it's a really useful space to put your work up. It's quite a strange beast because it will find work of yours that has been referenced by other people and put it up. So uh, when I went to it, I discovered all sorts of things of mine that I'd forgotten about, some of which I didn't necessarily want up anymore. And you can remove it. So you might actually want to go and look at your academia.edu profile and decide what you want to prioritize. Um, in terms of findability, if you tag the, 
the um, outputs that you put up, it, it definitely increases your findability and you can actually see that as you tag things. So that's really important. And as um, was mentioned earlier, it gives you transparent analytics. So when I had a look yesterday, for some reason in the last 32 days, I've had um, 41 uh, views from South Africa, which makes sense. Um, but I've also had 11 from the Philippines. So, I mean, that's really interesting. I'm really pleased that people from the Philippines are looking at some of my work on academia.edu. I'd be quite interested to know why and how, but it gives you that kind of data. Um, you can also see what your, if it's your profile be, that's being looked at, you can also look at what keywords are being used to find you. So it's very often not your name. It's often, um, I've done a few papers with uh, using Bourdieu, and so quite often it comes through people who've got an interest in Bourdieu, for example. Um, and um, that's really interesting. There's the, we, as I mentioned, we're also, we have been putting together some guides and some suggestions about improving your overall profile, um, many of which we've, we've discussed today, focus, uh, specialization, and so on. Um, just the one other thing, when we talk about academic outputs, I think it's really important to think about all scholarly outputs. So the, the system, those of us who are on academic terms, we get rewarded for very narrow notion of what academic outputs are. But of course, in fact, as scholars, uh, most of our outputs are academic and I would recommend very highly that they all get put on, on the web. Oh, here's an example of my uh, Google Scholar profile, which is something all of us can put together. And what's really nice about it is it shows you how many times it's been cited and so on. Um, uh, what's interesting is these kind of metrics vary from uh, platform to platform. So this is what Google Scholar says, academia.edu says something else. So this is something to keep an eye on as well. Um, because really, as, as academics, that's the question. That's, that's re so when we talk about the purpose, how can we make it an impact? How can we get our work out there to make an impact? And as I, as I was saying, I think one of the ways to do that is to broaden our, our idea of what an impact is. So the one aspect is what our performance reviews say an impact is, which is how many times you've been cited in an ISI listed journal. Well, that's really only one measure. It might be the measure that gets us, you know, um, into the next pay class or, or uh, promotion. But as academics, I think we're all interested in a much broader notion of impact. And the, the world of online resources and, and online um, outputs really provides so many more ways of measuring impact. Usage, downloads, as well as the traditional notions of peer review and citations, and then all the alt metrics. I think the alt metrics movement is one of the most interesting um, aspects of what's going on at the moment in the online space. And there's some really sophisticated work being done. You can go to Total Impact, for example, and have a look at um, your. Um, downloads and views in different spaces from the traditional ones. And somebody was asking me where I think it's all going. I, I wouldn't like to say so much about the personal professional, but I do believe that we are moving towards a wider notion of impact. Um, and I think that's happening through a mixture of changing practices, changing possible ways of measuring that, that impact. Um, advocacy, um, and so on. Okay. Oh, I think I have to have a little drink of water.
Anybody want to make any comments about any of the things I've said so far? Okay, so how do we get our stuff out there? This is where I go into open access advocate mode. It's, it is an effort, but I think we've made the case that it's an effort worth making. If you want people to find your stuff, if you want it to be discoverable, if you want to make an impact, you have to put it out there. So, just in the conventional sense, we need citations. And the route to go is to go as open as you can. Obviously, there are times you can't go open. Um, this might be for privacy reasons, it might be for quality reasons. You don't actually want people to read something you wrote at some period in your life. It might be for legal reasons. Um, that you, you're not able to. Sometimes uh, funders require that, I mean, if you do work for the South African government, sometimes you even have to sign the Official Secrets Act, which I think is another whole issue that we should really be agitating around, because I think if you're talking about openness, it, it extends to open government as well. But having said that, there are in fact a number of ways of making your work um, available in repositories, in uh, portals, in aggregators, in open access journals, and, and by publishing absolutely everything. There is evidence that this leads to increased citations. This is not just advocate talk. So Alma Swan, who's been working in this area for a very long time, did a meta-analysis of 35 studies of um, citations in open access, of open access articles across all the disciplines. And she found the uh, citations advantage ranged from 45% to as much as 600%. And in four cases that it was the same. It certainly won't do you any harm and it's very, very likely to do you good. Okay, so the first thing to do with existing journal articles. Everyone here is published in journals, I'm assuming, yeah? One tends to think, okay, I've given my copyright to the publishers, disseminating my work is their business. That is another whole discussion because for many publishers, making money is their business and they're not necessarily interested in disseminating your work, but We'll, we'll talk about that separately. What many publishers have now done and they've been forced to do is come into agreements with institutions and authors around self-archiving. And you can go to Sherpa Romeo and if I'm lucky I can even show it to you. Here we go, and you can search for a journal. Maybe just a view there. That would help, yeah. Okay, and you can find out that it's a green um, it's been allocated the green status, which means that you can archive pre-print and post-print of all um, publishers' versions of the PDF. So that means that here is a way of taking control of your own resources. Just about every university in the country has a repository. Librarians tear their hair getting academics to put their work into the pro repositories and very often they'll do it for you. Um, academics tend to think of this kind of activity as administrative 
more administrative work and they don't see the value. The value is your work will be found. Or look, if you write rubbish, it might be fine and people won't use it. So I'm assuming that what you have to say is worth saying. Put that aside. But you, you know, if it's in the repository, there is an opportunity for it to be found. Google searches will pick up the meta tags and quite often do full text searches. So put these up. Um, in the example I, I mentioned to you, we've been doing some research on findability. We, we did a search on poverty alleviation and we got people in 20 different parts of the world to search. And we wanted to know what South African resources came up. And the resources that came up were from South African open access institutional repositories. From Rhodes, from UNISA, from UJ, from Stellenbosch. The, pe the, pe the people who've been putting energy and effort into getting work into repositories for years. And that's not to say that the other universities, including my own, are not doing excellent work in poverty alleviation. It's to say that they haven't made it available and discoverable online. So what you need to do is, is find out whether you can and then do it. Of course, a lot of people just do it anyway. But if you want to be on the right side of your publishers, do it legally and it's very doable. Any questions about uh, this process, the publisher relations journal articles or comments? Um, we're just having this conversation at UJ uh, and the research office has deemed that all manuscripts will go into our digital archive space. And there are what, 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 despite the relation with the publisher? No, what the, whatever the uh, publisher says. Uh, okay. So if it, if it says pre, then the pre will go. If it says right. post, and if it says their PDF, then their PDF. And sometimes it's their PDF on embargo for two years or whatever. So the, the library has been managed, but the, the comments from the academics are very interesting is, oh, that's not my best work. So that's a very interesting comment, because how can your free uh, journal article not be uh, the best work that you can possibly submit? But uh, so institutionally, we have decided that this is going to happen. But there is a whole issue about copyright. Because at UJ, all staff members retain the copyright. Even though the journals have taken them, they still retain the copyright. So there is this big debate about how do we get around this. And so Creative Commons licensing is giving us a way around. But even still, some people say that they, they want their own copyright on the digital depository article. OK, well, we can have a discussion about Creative Commons. Creative Commons is copyright. It's a copyright where you're giving away the rights to use it. So that's the first misconception people have about Creative Commons. They think by using an open license, they're giving away the rights. They're actually keeping the rights. In fact, you've got more chance of keeping the rights because the basic right of attribution is absolutely insistent. Um, and that's a, that's a very interesting discussion. And what Creative Commons does is it gives you far more range of opportunity to express how you wish something to be used or not. I think your first point about the university mandating is a very interesting one. Um, and there's, a, there's an example in the University of Liège where academics who apply for promotion you know when you apply for promotion you have to put uh, provide a list of your outputs that list of outputs has to be printed from the university repository. Very simple. Amazing compliance. Um, so there are, there are a number of ways of doing it. But you know, those are almost administrative matters. I think the critical thing is for people to understand the value for them as individuals and academics who want to make a difference. That's really the point. I think people know why they're doing it. They'll do it. They'll find a way to do it. They'll get a student to do it. As long as it's regarded as yet another administrative burden, they won't because it's annoying. Because it's one more thing to do in a, an increasingly, you know, bureaucratic environment. And so the bureaucracy really has to be seen to serve our interests.
Okay, but there, there are more things that we can do. Obviously, there are our own institutional repositories, but there are other repositories that we can do, that we can use. Um, and so, I'm I don't actually know what disciplines people are in. Uh, what discipline? Somebody at the back, tell me what discipline you're in. Somebody at the back with the white shirt. That leaves three yeah, that leaves three of them. Yeah, what are you in? I'm in the New Testament. You're in? New Testament. Okay. Is there a repository of biblical studies? I don't know. It would be in a general one. A general one, okay. So the, the, but there might be. I mean, you know, the, the interesting thing is to actually find out. So, for example, archive, which is one of the most famous disciplinary repositories, um, and what's very interesting about it, this is physics and related, is they publish preprints. And what, there's a very interesting thing happening. Anyone here from physics? It's a pity because it's really good to hear the physics people talking about how they use this repository. They're not interested in publishers. They're not interested in journal articles. The status of this repository has become such that the preprints that go in are now actually the thing that count. It's a very different disciplinary culture. But the Social Science Research Network uh, repository is both a space to consider putting your work into and working with librarians to do so. Most librarians are absolutely delighted when academics express an interest in any of these kinds of things. Um, and of course for finding, you know, it's also another place to look for resources. And closer to home, there's the African Higher Education Research Online, a HERO repository which is uh, based at the University of the Western Cape, um, which has managed to keep limping along with very little resourcing and not enough support from academics. And what they are doing is they are curating our work. And they are doing the work of making it findable. So, if you are working in the area of higher education studies, put it into that repository. Uh, economics um, and related um, disciplines, repick. We've got examples of economists who are more keen to get their work into repick than to get into our institutional repository. You know, we're actually trying to find ways of harvesting our universities work from repick and it's it's another one of those spaces that has now got status as a, a an important place to go to and then of course there's the other old discussion around publishing in open access journals and I, I don't know how interesting or important this is to you but it's certainly an absolutely critical issue at the moment especially with the complete change in policy activities by funders in the global north at the moment. Shall I talk about that a little bit? Yeah? yeah? Okay. So what's happening in Europe, North America and the UK is that they are mandating that any research output produced with funds from the European Commission, the UK government, um, the National Institute of Health, some of these already exist, um, has to be made available open access. And some of these things, these are a very recent announcement and it's going to change the publishing landscape. And it's going to trickle down to us here in South Africa because if we have funding from any of those, if anyone's part of an EU project, or European Commission project, or DFID, um, the Spanish government is making, has just made a, a similar policy announcement, which I'm sure you're aware of, the Danish government. This is happening globally around public funds for research and open access publishing. And it actually means that we will have to find ways of uh, making available these resources. So, in fact, our behaviour is going to be changed by that 
big driver that it's so often changed by, which is the funders. Um, and uh, the, the UK is pushing for publishing open access journals. At the moment, about a third of academic journals are open access journals. So there's a lot of uh, discussion to be had around how that's going to happen, how journals are going to change, because they will change, to meet, to become compliant. Um, how academics are going to find some of those journals charge author costs, as some of you might know. Um, these are, are all issues we're all going to have to keep an eye on very closely. But at the moment it's possible to publish in open access journals and you can go to the, the directory of open access journals which has, um, as of yesterday, 8,100 journals are there. And just to clarify one common uh, point of confusion, open access journals are peer-reviewed journals. It doesn't, it's not an either or. They are peer-reviewed, they as good or as bad as any other journal. What they do have is a commitment to making the um, output available free to readers. And um, some of them are obviously on the lists. And then, as I was saying, I think beyond the actual journal article. That's just a, a subset. So if you're doing a talk, if you are doing things in the classroom, you can put things on YouTube, but you can also put things on Vimeo, which tends to be a more kind of professional, creative uh, space. And you can put things on YouTube and make them available under Creative Commons licenses, which means you are actually legally stating, please use my work. Please remix, depending on the kinds of Creative Commons license that you provide. Um, here's a, a fascinating uh, news announcement from YouTube, that there are actually four million Creative Commons licensed videos on YouTube as per July this year which are obviously available for us to use but there's no reason why our work shouldn't be up there as well. And I think many people don't realise this. You can, you can go to the YouTube ed editor and legally and legitimately use those videos and contribute those videos. Upload your presentations. How many of you upload your presentations? Two, three. Anna, four. You, 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 you. Okay, so of, for anything. Okay, five. All right. Hopefully this time next year when Paul asks this question, the answer will be everybody. It's so easy and it's a way of sharing that work you've done. So I did a, a talk at UCT last October on online presence for academics. It was shorter than this one, it was a short talk. And the academics there said to me, we'd like to have a look at your slides and I put it up on, on, on SlideShare and it's had 7,000 views. Clearly this is an interest of, this is a, a topic of interest to academics. Um, it's a fa I mean, it's, it's great. I did all that work. Unfortunately, I couldn't use much of it again this year, but things change and the, the terrain moves. But it's really easy and it's really worth it. Uh, this talk I did about a month, two months ago has had 32 downloads. That's great. It makes me feel like somebody might be listening. I mean, I don't know if it's changed anything, but it at least makes me feel heard or whatever. It's easy. And then lastly, make sure that your resources are properly curated. Just have a read of that cartoon.
up till the time. So everyone kind of goes all blank and weirdo about curation. It's this obscure thing that I think people in libraries do, so we don't really quite know. Digital curation actually, to my mind, is one of the most critical skills of the future. I mean, I'm, I'm really not one for predictions, because we all get proved wrong, but this is one of my few predictions. And it's about making sure that online content is properly indexed, described, tagged, and findable. Because it's just not true that if you put it online, it's on the web, that's enough. It's not. It just isn't. When I started doing this work I'm doing at UCT around the Open UCT initiative, we found so much good free work on UCT websites that it was completely unfindable because it wasn't properly curated. And curation is a really important new professional skill, an old one that's become modified and has become a new critical one. This is my last point, and I love this point. Metadata is a love note to the future. It's not a dull, dire, dreadful, boring bit that we ignore. It's actually the thing that makes all the difference. So I think if, if you leave today with one point from me, that's it. Get it online and make it findable. Okay, and I really have to start, stop talking. Um, and so I'm going to leave you for a moment or two to consider, discuss, think about these three issues. Okay, are you persuaded? Are you making a plan? Are you finding the money? I must tell you the best thing to do is to find a very capable postgraduate student and um, get some help from the library who will be more than happy to help with guidelines and suggestions and practical advice. And remember, we're talking about all outputs. Your newspaper articles, your blogs, Paul was just telling me that at his performance review, he insisted on taking his blog with. And I think that's the way things are actually, the envelope is being pushed. Have a wider view of what your output is. And of course, your teaching materials. Those are, those are hugely valuable. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about, and I'm, I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. I'm mindful that um, we have other workshops and talks coming up, is give some thought to how much you want to connect and communicate. Social bookmarking, anyone here on Delicious or site you like? One. One? One? No. <laughs> Serious? Okay. I'm not even going to say, do you know what delicious or such you like? I'm just going to show you. Okay, so let's try this again. Does everyone here bookmark websites? Yes. Okay, so if you're bookmarking websites, why are you doing it on one browser, on one computer, when you can do it on something like delicious, which you can access from anywhere, everywhere, and which is shareable. So, here's an example of my colleague Eve Gray's delicious bookmarks. So Eve bookmarks everything that she finds interesting in her area of interest, which is also my area of interest. And I am able to keep an eye on interesting stuff out there by following Eve. And so can you. And you can follow me as well, except I'm fairly a bit more eclectic. But you don't have to make everything publicly available. 
So I also have um, private, let's see if I can just show you. So there's my uh, delicious, that's open and up, and you can see some of them are private for whatever reason. It's not interesting, I'm ashamed that you, the world should know, whatever. Okay. And it means that you also have another kind of presence. It's a different type of presence, it's a kind of curation presence, but it's part of having an online um, presence. Site You Like is a more um, academic uh, social mark, uh, bookmarking space. And what I did there is I had a look to see who has bookmarked some of my papers. Which is quite a nice way of getting a sense of my, my presence as well. And these are the people who, who've posted or used some of my papers. I'm not actually on Site You Like myself, but other people have bookmarked some of my things. Okay, some of these... Um, Environments are more than social, social bookmarking spaces. Diego, Man Mendeley and ResearchGate are the main ones. Um, I personally just recently moved on, uh, joined Mendeley. So I can't comment on Diego and ResearchGate myself, but they do have significant numbers of academics um, on them. Um, if I'm not mistaken, ResearchGate says it's got something like two million people, but it's mostly in the sciences. So Mendeley is a referencing, managing, social bookmarking, community space that is also device agnostic, which is really nice. So you can uh, work on something um, and you can annotate it and you can see it from different devices and you can share it or not share it. Um, and what's also quite nifty is that you can also use Readometer to do an assessment of your presence on Mendeley. So you can see who else is using your work, referencing your work, um, citing your work, and so on. So it's, it's taking that notion of sharing resources, communicating, managing, and social bookmarking into a completely different space. Very exciting space. Um, ResearchGate is the one that I mentioned that's more for scientists. Um, so those people who are working particularly in the sciences would probably find a, a better community there. But there are lots of ways to make your name as a curator. Um, those of you on Twitter will have seen people using Scoopit, which is a kind of a magazine type of space. And there are lots of different tools you can use. And that's really a kind of a, I'm the person who finds you interesting stuff you want to follow. Um, Bitly allows you to actually put your name on it. So now Steve Walker, who's very active in the learning technology world, has a daily collection of stuff he finds interesting. And there is absolutely no reason why any of us couldn't do the same. It's another way of extending your academic online presence is becoming known as the person who knows about certain areas. And of course, I almost didn't include this because it's so obvious. Get onto Twitter. I'm presuming everyone here is on Twitter. We're not talking about Lady Gaga. We're talking about as a professional space. Do I need to show anybody Twitter? No. Get onto Twitter. At least during this conference, which, which officially starts tomorrow, ODL 12. What Paul did at the beginning of this workshop is standard practice at conferences. It's the back channel. It's the space. It's also the way of people who are not here to participate. So Derek Moore in, jo in Joburg can send a question or a comment through while I'm speaking. And it's a way of participating when you're not at something. So it's an, I would say it's a critical professional online presence space, Twitter. 
And the London School of Economics has produced a fantastic guide to Twitter for academics. How to use um, Twitter academically. I would recommend having a look at that. And last but not least, write a blog. The scholarship of engagement. Blogging is right there. And I think we have one of our very best examples of scholarly blogging in the front row with Paul Prinsloo's excellent academic blog, which he has the discipline to update every week and which is read throughout the world. It's not only fantastic for his reputation, it's fantastic for the reputation of the institution which, in which he works. I can only recommend it highly. I must say that blogging takes a particular type of voice and not everyone feels able to develop that voice. But it's certainly, in terms of the scholarship of engagement, a really important one. We have an opening scholarship blogged um, aggregator at our university where several of us who work in this space blog. And so you can follow my blog, my colleagues' blogs, and five or six of us at the university. Um, another way of doing this, and you might want to do this as a department or as a group, have some kind of a blog aggregator. And then, then there are others. You can go to Research Blogger, for example. It's another very legitimate and important space for academics as public intellectuals. And it even lands up, as in this particular case, in other types of impacts where blogs have been made into books, which land up playing the academic game as well. Um, as I mentioned, and this is my, my last point, we have been uh, developing a guide based on the, the, the many points I've covered today, and we will be making it available. And of course, I'm very happy to continue this conversation, which I had hoped would be more of a two-way conversation. But thank you for your patience. <laughs>